worship the Lord. right now. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you sent your son to die the death that we deserve, God. That he took our sins, Lord. He bared that on the cross for us. Lord, there's no greater love than that. There's no greater love than the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. was my cross
Isn't he worthy? Worthy of our praise, worthy of our adoration. Something the Lord put on my heart this morning as I was just thinking about Easter weekend is almost how symbolic it is of our experiences in life in following Jesus. You're going, everything's great. You're experiencing God's presence in really beautiful and power ways. Then that Good Friday moment hits dark night, that heavy moment where like, I don't know anymore. I've got some doubt. I've got some concern. I've got some worry. 
You gotta sit through Saturday where you're sitting there waiting. You're like, I don't know what's going on. Sunday comes. You're reminded of hope. You're reminded of joy and the peace that awaits the trials, that awaits the difficulties we experience in this life. I'm so grateful for this moment what we remember every Sunday when we get together, but especially when we get here on Easter Sunday, that we have hope in the name of Jesus. No matter what you go through in this life, no matter how dark it gets, how tough it is, you have a promise, a future, an inheritance that's secured in the name of Jesus. We can lift up our voice and we can praise him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to continue worship this morning through giving of tithes. If you consider Grace City Church your home, uh, we encourage you to give. If you're a guest with us this morning, please don't feel any obligation to give. We believe that the Bible Institute's giving for two primary purposes. The first is it's a response of obedience to what God has done for us in our lives. And it's this humble moment where we recognize that anything we have, whether it be provisions or the number in your bank account, anything that you have that you own is only because of God's presence and gifting in your life first. And it's humbly acknowledging that, Lord, I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for you. Sure, I might have worked hard. Sure, I might have put a lot into earning this. But I wouldn't have that if you hadn't blessed me with the skills to do this or the passions to pursue this, the work ethic to gain. So we give back a portion of what we've received because we want to humbly acknowledge that God is the one who gifted it to us first. So we give back a portion to him. And second, we believe that the Bible Institute's giving because it's the means in which the local church and various other ministries around the world are empowered to carry the gospel further and further to places where it's needed most. We believe that Lane County desperately needs the gospel of Jesus. And I know there's an abundance of amazing churches in Lane County that you could be a part of, that you could participate with, but I'm really grateful for what God's doing through this church, the ways that he's making us effective on campus, the ways that he's using us to reach families, the ways that he's reaching us and making us a, a multi-generational community. And when we give, it's a way that we get to steward this community that we've been brought into. We get to further the kingdom of God advancing through Grace City Church. And so if you call Grace City your home, I please, I encourage you, invest in what God is doing in this church. Participate with us in this way because God is doing some amazing things and it's so fun to be a part of. There's a few different ways you can give today. You can text the word Grace City Eugene to the number 77977. You could give online at gracecityeugene.com slash give, or you could give through cash or check back at our welcome booth. We've got some envelopes that you can put any funds that you want to give there. But I just want to pray for our giving, for our, for our posture, and uh, that God would use it. So would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we are so thankful for the ways that you've blessed us, the ways that you've provided for us, so, Father, uh, we just respond in this moment with, with trust and with hope and with anticipation of the great things that you want to do through our partnership with you in your kingdom. Uh, thank you, God. You, yeah, you could have just done this all on your own, but you've given us a purpose. And that purpose is to join you in stewarding your world and preaching the gospel. And so, Father, we just give this morning trusting that it's good that we do this and that you want to use us to continue furthering your kingdom in Lane County and beyond. So would you bless every dime and dollar that's given, and would you use it to further our efforts for the ministry of Jesus continuing on through the church? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are going to take a break in just a moment as we transition some things on stage. But before we do that, I just want to welcome any guests that are with us today. We're so thankful that you've decided to jump in with us. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you've been checking this out for a few weeks. I just want to extend an opportunity for you to connect. Um, there's a lot of great things you can learn about a church on a Sunday morning. But it's certainly not everything. Um, and that's definitely the case for our church. 
Uh, this is just a portion of what we believe the church is supposed to be, and it's very much a portion of who our specific community is. And so uh, we have got these opportunities for you to follow up so that you will have some clear directions and opportunities to learn more about what it looks like to be a part of Grace City. You can ask questions that are valuable or important to you so that you can feel safe and secure at this home and feel like you've been welcomed in and invited. And the way that you get to do that is by uh, texting to connect. You can text the word FIRST if you're a first-time guest with us, if you've never entered into this kind of connection process with us before, to the number 458-236-3311. You're going to get an automated text back at FIRST, uh, but then eventually, uh, probably me, maybe Pastor Chris, uh, will be following up with you about your experience here at church, giving you the opportunity to ask questions, learn more, hear about what we've got going on. Uh, so please, if you're a first-time guest, text the word FIRST. If you're a returning guest, uh, maybe you've you've came once, you've entered into that process before, I um, mean, you're kind of in this place of like, you know what, I do want to learn a little bit more. I do want to dive a bit deeper. I want to learn about groups and events and opportunities and things that are happening here at the church. You can text the word RETURN to 458-236. 3311. And if you do either of those today, uh, we've got a gift for you. And there's a gift for each of those follow up processes. So if you got one gift, please make sure you go back and get your other one. You'll just have to show that confirmation text, and somebody from our hospitality will send you home with a lovely gift. We're so grateful that you're here with us, and we pray that uh, just this worship environment this morning is encouraging and uplifting as you celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We're going to take a three-minute break. That's a great time to follow up with this step if you're new around here. Uh, but you can also say hi to someone around you. Grab some water. Grab some coffee. There's a lot of us here. I bet the coffee is flying. You better get there quick if you want coffee. Uh, kids can go to class. If you are fifth through eighth grade, you're going to meet Griffin in the back corner of the room, kind of over by the entrance. That will be your class today for youth. If you are anything younger than fifth grade, nursery up through fourth grade, you're going to meet the Kid City team in the back corner by the welcome booth, and they will bring you up to class. All of us in here, say hi to someone you haven't met before. Rush that coffee, but don't run too fast. There's a lot of us. And uh, I'll call us back in a few minutes. Ready? Break. <laughs>
again, we are so thankful that you're here with us today. I don't think I've mentioned so far, uh, my name is Casey. I serve as the associate pastor here at Grace City. Really thankful for, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, if you are new around here too, one of the things that you could do is you can find anyone wearing one of these here to serve uh, badges. We'd love to help you with any questions, whether it's the kind of follow up next step process uh, or whether that is um, finding the bathrooms. I know when you're new around somewhere, uh, you sometimes just need some help. So uh, I'll be hanging out kind of in the back of the room during the sermon for the most part. So if you need anything, come find me or find somebody wearing one of these here to serve badges. We'd love to, to help you. Uh, before we jump into the message this morning, I've just got two announcements for us. Uh, it's technically one with two parts, but we're not going to go there. Um, that went really bad last time. I may have made a reference to the Trinity that some people didn't like. And so uh, we're going to do two announcements. Can everybody say two? Yeah. Announcement number one. Life groups are kicking off this week as early as tomorrow. Uh, we've got two groups meeting on Monday nights. And we've got a group on Tuesday. And then we've got two groups on Thursday nights. And so we've got a space for you. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity to lean in and make this church your home. Again, so many amazing things that happen in a space like Sunday, but the opportunity to be known and to know others and to grow closer to God best happens when you gather in someone's home, when you share a meal, when you engage intentionally in discipleship content, whether that's the scriptures directly or videos or devotionals, whatever it may be. Um, small groups are an amazing place to know others and to get to grow closer to God with others. And so we would encourage you uh, to, to jump into this space. Uh, life groups really are like the, the core of who we are as a church. Before we ever were a church, we were a small group and small groups that uh, eventually said, yeah, we can be a church. And uh, so we, we've never lost that from our DNA and we would love to have you join in with us. To join a life group, you can text the word life group to 458-236-3311. You'll get a response to register for groups this spring. And uh, we've got some really, some really cool plans, some really fun opportunities for you to lean in. And if you haven't already, be sure to just save that number, 458-236-3311, as a contact in your phone. Uh, that way, anytime we've got different things going on, all you got to do is just pull up Grace City Church as a contact in your phone and shoot them a text. Uh, so that's announcement number one. Announcement number two is that in life groups this term, we're going to be rolling out a really new content that's going to be a, an important piece of our discipleship process as a church called Establish. Now, if you've been around Grace City at all, if you've been around the Every Nation world, which is the family of churches we belong to, um, we believe that the discipleship journey is made up of four parts. You engage the lost, which means you go out and you meet someone so that the process can start. You establish them in biblical foundations. You equip them to serve in the ministry, and then you empower them to serve in the ministry. Everything we do as a church is intended to help people engage in wherever they're at in that process. And one of the things that we realized as a church is that we could be more intentional to invest in some systems and structures to help people be established in the faith. We've had record numbers of baptisms over the last few years. It's been a blast to see. Um, but we want to help people that are new to faith, but also those that have maybe been around and maybe forgotten some things. Because how many of y'all know that when we're not like actively engaged in certain uh, like resources or training, we just kind of forget things over time. So we've, we've made this established course as an opportunity for people to be rooted in biblical and theological truths that have been essential to the church from the very beginning, and we're going to roll it out in life groups this term. So if you sign up for a life group, you're going to get to go through this established course, uh, but then after life groups, we're going to roll it out as kind of a rotating course that's offered for folks that are joining our community or folks that just want to brush up on some essential doctrines of the church. And so we're really excited about this. We've put a ton of work into making it happen, and uh, it's going to be a really, really great time. So please 
join us in life groups. We're going to have an awesome time rolling through this established course. And uh, more importantly, we're going to just have a really amazing time deepening our relationships with one another and with God. So that's what we've got going on. If you want to follow up more with Grace City, you can follow us on social media at Grace City Eugene on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, if you are on uh if you do email stuff, which I understand some of us don't love emails, uh, please, you know, when you fill out that that connect card, it gets us an opportunity to put you in our email system so you can hear about different events and opportunities to connect as well. So please do that. But without further ado for our sermon today, would you please help me welcome up Pastor Chris. <laughs> How we doing? That was loud. I'm sorry. How we doing? It's good to be with you all here today. As Casey mentioned, my name is Chris, and it's my great honor, privilege, and responsibility to be the lead pastor here, and it's great to see all your faces this morning for Resurrection Sunday. It's good to be in the house together, isn't it? It's good to see y'all. Um, it's always a joy to you know, you go, th- and this year it was tagged on to spring break, but to go through all the preparation, all the, the thoughts of how we can put together a good Friday service and the special elements of what uh, goes into, you know, a, a very special Sunday for us who follow Jesus and to get here and see everyone's face and be like, all right, let's talk about this now. It's, it's exciting stuff. And so um, I'm honored that you're here with us. If I haven't had the chance to meet you before and you're maybe joining us for the first time or for the first couple times today, please come say hi after service. I would love to meet you. I know the tendency can be like, let me snag a few donut holes, shove them in the pocket and jet before somebody because like... We are small enough that people probably know if you haven't been here before, but I promise we won't be weird. I just would love to meet you. I'm honored and privileged that uh, you chose to spend this Sunday with us, and I pray that you're blessed and that you encounter Jesus through your time here today. Amen? Amen. So today, if you didn't know, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith. This isn't just some little thing we celebrate today. It's not just like, oh, yeah, there's that thing. It's like, no, this is the Thing, the cornerstone of our faith, it's the, the crowning proof that Jesus defeated death and that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And that's the filter that we view everything we say and do here today through. So just want to make sure that we're all on the same page getting into today. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to dive into the word. So Father, thank you. We pray that today you would meet each one of us here. God, I thank you for whatever it took to get each one of us into this building today. God, we acknowledge that there are not accidents that you have sought after each one of us, that there is intentionality in our relational spheres and even in the leading of your spirit to bring us into this place today. So God, I pray that you would take the same care to encounter each person personally and tangibly this morning. I pray that my words would be inspired by your spirit and would fall upon open hearts and open minds and that you would do a miracle in our lives here today just like you did a miracle when the tomb was empty. And so we thank you for that, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So to set the context for today's message, we're actually going to uh, be in two verses, just to set the context out of Matthew 28. You can turn there while I, while I get going, but that's where we're going to start today. And, um, and I want to give you a little insight as we, as we get into this. Um, After Jesus rose from the dead, if you're not familiar with the scriptures and you haven't kind of read all the different accounts of it, you can think like, oh, there's just this one person or these two people or whatever that that went to the tomb and Jesus wasn't there. And so it can seem like rather insignificant as far as um, how big of a deal this is. But in scripture, in the New Testament, there's 13 separate accounts, what theologians call post-resurrection appearances of Jesus before he ascends into heaven. 13, not one, not one half, not three, 13 post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. He appeared to the women near the tomb. He appeared to two men on the walk to Emmaus. He appeared to 10 of the disciples um, here. And then he appeared to 500 of the brethren at one point in time. He came to a meal. He took the disciples fishing and he took them up a mountain. He was the resurrected Jesus of the beaches and the mountains. Like he did it. He did it all. He appeared 13 different times to his disciples. 
And in Matthew 28, the disciples were on a mountain before the ascension. And if you don't know what the ascension is, this is when a Jesus, he ascended into the cloud, into heaven, which had to be amazing. And if I'm quite honest, like sometimes my imagination gets a hold of me. I'm just like, whoa, what would that have been like? Not the point of the message today, but maybe you can dive into that more on, on your own time. Um, but before he ascended into heaven and was taken up on a cloud, he gave his disciples a divine assignment, a divine assignment. And he told them to do the very same thing that he tells us to do. And that was to go into all the world, meaning everywhere, and tell people the story of what had just happened, to tell them the gospel that Jesus is the God, or he's of God, he's a son of God, that he was without sin, he became sin for us, that he died on a cross, that God raised him from the dead so that anybody who knows him, who believes in him, could be forgiven and would be transformed. That is his divine assignment. As he's ascending, he's like, hey, this is what you're going to go tell everybody. Not just your friends, not just your neighbors, everybody. You're going to go tell them this, the whole world. That's what Jesus told them. And then there's this verse in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, 16 and 17. So the very same chapter of the resurrection, and so many people miss this. And I want to I hone in on this today. And I actually picked the New Living, New Living Translation, or the NLT, for today's scripture. So it's a little different than usual, but uh, Matthew 28, 16, 17 says this. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw Jesus... What did they do? When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. So Jesus has been around post-resurrection for a minute. These guys had been walking with Jesus. He had foretold them what was going to happen. He told them his plan, and they just couldn't wrap their simple minds around it. And now they see him, and they're right there at the top of this mountain where he told them to meet him. And it says some of them still doubted. Some of them still doubted. The title of today's message is this. Jesus can handle your doubt. Can I get an amen? Amen. Jesus can handle your doubt. Because if the disciples entered into this moment with all of their experience and all of the knowledge they had. Now remember, they didn't have the entire Bible. They don't know how the story ends. Yet they walked with this man for three years and they doubted. Those of you that are in this room today that have doubts, Jesus can handle your doubts. He is not insecure. He knows who he is. He knows who he's called you to be. And he can handle them. And a little side note here. I don't know if it's just me, but it's, it's, I think it's a little observation about human nature, but I'll just take it for, for the team today and say it's me. Do you ever, like, feel better about yourself when, like, somebody else is having some challenges with their faith or something like this? Like, why I say this is I read this about the disciples, I'm like, oh, praise God. Like, if they had this challenge, this problem, I don't feel so bad. Does anybody ever feel that way? You're like, or there's somebody that's like super famous and you're like, yeah, they got struggles too. That's right. Because, you know, we think that everybody that has more money or more fame or whatever else than us never has struggles. Or we think the people on the stage never have trouble or, or struggles. Well, just come get to know me and you'll find out that's not true. But uh, like, there's just something comforting about the disciples doubting because it almost gives me permission to be imperfect, permission to be honest about the things that I wrestle with internally and with some people externally as well. And it's, it's a really weird thing about human nature, but I think it's worth um, just noting because I know for me, I can feel so close to God sometimes. And then I still have doubts. I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but there's times when it's, I'm almost like, I feel like I'm in the presence of God. It's like, man, if God was ever speaking to me audibly, it was right now. If I ever felt like I could, there was a tangible presence of God, it, it would be in this moment. It's like, I believe he's with me. And if you told me in those moments, God's not real, I'd be like, yeah, right, your mom's not real. Like, of course he's real. Like, I, I feel like I, I, everything about this moment, it's like, he's there. It's saturated with him. And then there's other times where, like, I can be in the middle of, of, of the presence of God or in, in church or something and, and with a bunch of people and maybe even getting ready to preach. And then 
like questions start flooding my mind. And I'm like, I am saturated in a Christ-centered, Christ-honoring environment. And I can be in the midst of my hands raised and singing, and then all of a sudden, I have doubts. And then the enemy's like, oh, you better not go up there, boss. You're, you have those doubts, and you're about to go preach, and tries to tell me how I'm disqualified. And anything that might come out of my mouth after that doubt is now, like, going forward doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless. And there's, there's all these things that happen in my mind because doubt tries to keep us quiet. Doubt tries to take our voice. It tries to take our faith. It tries to hush us when really doubt is a really cool tool. And that's what I want to help us understand today. It can be scary to ask questions. It can be scary to ask questions. And sometimes when you're in the midst of a resurrection Sunday and everybody's singing and they got a full band and there's news people and it seems like everybody's excited because one person raised their hand so everyone else was following the lead and before you know it, you're like, what am I doing in this room? And you start to have a question and you're like, am I the only one in this room with questions? Like, no, you're not. In fact, I bet most of us in the last 24 hours have had some sort of question about who God is, his calling in our life and why things work out the way they work out. But it can be scary. And then the enemy likes to co-opt those things and make us feel ashamed or that, you know, you feel guilty for having questions. You feel guilty and ashamed for having doubts. And, and I'm convinced that in my personal tenure of pastoring, that there are some people that are leaving the church, not because God isn't good, but because they have questions they don't feel safe asking. It's not because God isn't good. It's not because they haven't encountered him. It's not because even they've changed their belief in him, but they have questions and they just don't feel safe asking them. I'm convinced that there are people that just don't feel like they can safely express their doubts. Now, you can ask the question, like, is that a reality or is that just like an attack of the enemy? Is that just kind of a, a mind play thing? Well, quite frankly, I don't think it matters because the church just doesn't talk about it enough. And especially if you're in a faith-filled, spirit-filled church, we can often just be like, come on now, big faith, let's go. And we just want to, like, charge the mountain, right? We're like, or you've heard this term, we just want to charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. And we just want to, you know, have big faith. And it's like, if you focus so much on that, what you're telling people is just ignore the doubts and ignore the questions instead of actually encountering them and giving people permission to ask them. Giving people permission to ask them. Do you ever wonder why, like, we battle with doubts? Why we doubt? Why is there doubt in the church? When we look at the world, why is there doubt? And personally, I see several reasons. I don't, you know, I don't come here today and be like, I got it. Here's my thesis. It's just one. Like, no, there's, there's a few, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. But I believe one reason is there are questions that you can't answer, so you have doubts. There are questions you can't answer. Sometimes you come across something in the Bible and you say, well, that's there. I don't know what to do with it. And if it says this and I'm not quite sure about it, I don't quite understand, I, like, am I just supposed to move forward and ignore it and act like it doesn't exist? Or is there actually a place that I can ask questions that I can say, gosh, I have my doubts about this. Is there somebody I can process through this with? And then sometimes there's situations that just plain seem unfair. You're thinking, okay, I, I prayed about that, and I know God can do it, but he didn't. Why? Has anybody ever wrestled with that one? I believe 100% that God could, and I prayed that he would, but it didn't, at least not yet. And we can wrestle with those things. It can be challenging. It can be hard, and it can start to sow this seed of doubt. Like, does he even love me? Like, am I even saved if he's not answering my prayers? Like, yes. Um, that's a whole nother sermon. But you start asking yourself these questions. And then there's the thing, that whole, uh, the whole thing that bad things happen to good people. And then on the flip side, there's good things that happen to bad people. And then there's stuff in the world like innocent children starving and suffering and people being hurt and killed and maimed in wars all around the world. Senseless violence and things that just aren't fair. Can anybody feel me on this? Sometimes I just have to, like, make sure that I'm not getting notified by any news or social media whatsoever because it's just not fair, the things that happen in this world. And it causes us to wonder, where in the world is God? 
And then if you, if you attach that to the fact that we feel shame and guilt if we ask these questions, like, no, just have faith. Don't ask those questions. No, 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 no. Sweep that under the rug. Now let's just move forward in faith. Like, no. Ask the question. Jesus can handle your doubts. He is not insecure. He is not too small for your doubts. Your doubts are not bigger than his miraculous power because the same power that rose him from the, from the grave can raise you out of your old life into your new life. He can handle it. He can handle it. And then sometimes it's because there's hurts that you just can't resolve. There's hurts. You looked up to somebody and they said they were a Christian or you knew they were a part of a church and they hurt you, they betrayed you, they mistreated you. Maybe they even did something like violent or harmful or abusive to you and, and it was in the name of belonging to some sort of church and you felt like church and church people or Christians should be a safe place but that hasn't proved to be real or right in your experience and those things can just be hard to get over. They can be hard to talk about. Unfortunately, sometimes places aren't as safe as we need them to be or we would like them to be. And then sometimes it's just Christians that make you have doubts. Can we be honest for a second? Because Christians are humans. Christians have not fully arrived to any certain status of perfection, highest level of character and integrity. We're still people just like anybody else. There, you, I have this conversation with people sometimes like, you know, I'm just, I'm just looking for the perfect church for me. I'm like, okay, if you find it, stay out of it because then you've ruined it. Like there's, there's no such thing as the perfect church if there's people in it. We are all imperfect. We all bring our experiences, our nuance, our biases. And the goal of church is that we can overcome those tensions for the sake of Christ and his mission, not that we can turn a blind eye to them and just ignore that they even happen. Doubts are okay. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that we may have been a part of causing someone else to doubt. And that's why conversations need to be allowed, encouraged. Jesus can handle your doubt. He can handle your doubt. And today, I want to show you that your doubts handled properly can actually be a catalyst for stronger faith, not disqualify you from faith. They can be a catalyst for stronger faith. Your doubts don't have to take you away from God. Your doubts can actually draw you closer to him. Now, if that's new, good news for you, somebody say amen, because I know it is for me. Because I can think, gosh, I have doubts. Am I backsliding? I have doubts. Oh my gosh, should I even be up there singing or playing bass or should I be preaching? Should I be meeting with people this week or do I need to figure out everything? It's like, no, I never will. Like how prideful to think that I could. But this is great news for me. Your doubts can actually draw you closer to God. Because it's so important to understand that your faith is actually a journey. It's not a destination. Having faith doesn't mean you've made it from the finish line to the end. And you're like, that's right. Now I have faith. I've received my PhD in faith. I have my master's in faith. I have my diploma on the wall. Look at Pastor Chris, diploma of faith. Like, no. It's a journey that you are always on. You're always working on. It's not like I, I got the accreditation and all that. Like, there's a reason that with certain high-level education and professions, they call it practicing, right? You're practicing medicine. You're practicing law. I am practicing faith every day. Just because I have it doesn't mean it's perfected. Just because I have it right now doesn't mean it's at the same level or carrying the same steam, yes, or tomorrow as it may right now. Your faith is a journey. You don't ever just arrive at some level of faith. And I pray that that's good news and freeing to some of you in this room today. You don't ever arrive. There is no such thing as I just have faith always. And like no matter what, no matter what happens every single day, I just have this high level of faith. Right? I'm like, no, some days are hard. Some moments have doubt. Maybe some months Maybe some years have doubt, but Jesus can handle your doubt. Jesus can handle your doubt. <clears throat> if there's questions, if there's doubt, it's not time to panic. How many of us maybe panic a little when we feel the questions setting in, right? It's like, oh my gosh, it's like your chest tightens up and maybe you can't get a full breath. You're like, gosh, where did that come from? It's like, no, if there's questions and there's doubt... Don't panic. It's time to process. It's time to process through them. 
It's time to talk because the church and your home and your close friends should be the safest places in the world to ask the hard questions. Amen? These should be the safest places in the world to ask hard questions, not the ones where you feel shame and insecure to actually process through things. And I hope that you'll discover that the strongest faith is not the faith that never doubts. The strongest faith is the faith that grows through your doubts. You see, doubts are actually a mechanism that grow your faith as you go through them. It's almost like a weight room, like you're working out those muscles. You're getting stronger because you're encountering challenges and questions and doubts. And as you put your faith in Jesus and you see him work in them, you get strengthened in your faith through those moments. For example, the disciple Thomas in the Bible after the resurrection in John chapter 20, verse 24, John's gospel tells us this. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. That's what the disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Now this is funny because if you study the Greek, in the Greek language, the verb is actually the active tense. Now, what does that mean? Let me tell you. It means that they would have been saying it over and over and over. Anybody have kids or been around kids a lot in the room? Yeah, in the back seat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. I'm hungry. I'm hung The active tense. It wasn't just like, we've seen Jesus once and you get the point. It was this incessant, we've seen him. We've seen him. They couldn't stop talking about it. But Thomas replied to them, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. I won't believe unless I put my fingers into them. I won't believe unless I place my hand into the wounds on his side. And that's the reason that Thomas has been given kind of a bad rap and is known as Doubting Thomas, is that scripture right there. And I'm here to tell you that he's gotten just that. He's gotten a bad rep. Because I think when we refer to that as like, oh, doubting Thomas, how dare he want proof or ask questions, what we're doing is we're kind of telling people in the church, like, hey, don't ask questions, don't doubt. That's a bad thing. We like make fun of Thomas for that. But we have to acknowledge that we're giving him a bad rep because we should be able to ask questions. And this might actually be more of a case study of Jesus meeting us in our doubt than we shouldn't doubt. And I believe that the church as a whole has done a poor job at highlighting this, at giving people permission to have questions. Now, I'm giving you all permission to have questions today, and you got to give me permission not to be able to answer them all, okay? I'm not saying, ah, come on, ask your questions. This isn't some game show, but what I'm saying is we can process things. It's okay, because Jesus can handle your doubt. Thomas is getting a bad rep. In fact, I think that his doubts should be a little more dignified than they have been in church history. Because the only reason those other guys were believing and Thomas wasn't is what? They were there. They saw him. Thomas hadn't. It's not like they were like, oh, I heard he's in town. I didn't see him and I believe it. No, they, they had seen him already. Like, they, they had a, a little bit of a leg up on him. They'd already seen him. Thomas, getting a bad rep here. Now, I believe that there's many of you in this room today, like me, that can relate to Thomas. Maybe you just want some proof. Maybe you just need, you just want to, you just want to experience Jesus. Like in, you want to experience his presence. You, there's just something that wants to verify his power and his presence in your life. Can anybody relate to that? It's not that you don't believe he's not like risen, that he's not God, that he didn't live, die, and, and raise from the dead. It's just, I just want to experience like his presence again. Maybe it's been a minute and you just want to experience him again. I can relate to Thomas in this. He was just a realist. He just wanted to know. He's like, come on, look. Can I touch him? Can I, can I feel him? Can I, can I verify a few things? Can I, can I know that he's here and he's with us? He's in our midst. And I'm guessing that Thomas is a lot like us, that he's been through some things before. Some things in the world that he lived in and the, some things in the world we live in have We've seen some things, and it's caused us to ask different layers of questions, to filter through things a little more intentionally, because maybe we've been bamboozled before. Maybe we've been hurt. Maybe we've seen people manipulate, lie, whatever it is. But we've seen some things, and it causes us to just ask some questions. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
Maybe you've had some disappointments, some heartbreaks, some very real, very honest, very sincere, very complicated questions that have popped into your mind or that you're wrestling with right now. And just because you, we, have those questions doesn't make you bad. It just makes you human. It doesn't make you bad. It doesn't mean you lack faith. It just means you're human, for goodness sake. In fact, Oswald Chambers said it this way. Doubt is not always a sign that man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. It may be a sign that he's thinking. Hear me on this. Your doubts do not disqualify your faith. Your doubts do not disqualify your faith. And so if maybe your kids or, or you or somebody that you're helping encounter Jesus start to have questions, it's not a time to panic. It's a time to process. It's a time to talk about it. Keep pressing into the things of God. Don't hold your engagement hostage for all the answers. Because guess what? Oftentimes the answers come in the processing. The answers come as you're walking towards something, not as you turn your back to it and be like, come on, if you really want me, you'll turn me around. Like, yeah, he could, but love is a reciprocal thing. And he loves us. He wants us to love him. So why won't you just take a step and see? Step towards him and see that he is good. See what he has for you. Do not hold your engagement hostage for the answer to your question the way you think you deserve to have it answered. He's God. He knows better. Will you trust him and will you continue to press into the things of God? And watch here. How did Jesus respond to Thomas's doubt? The scripture says that Jesus did this. On eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was there. Don't miss this. How many days later? Eight days later. I want you to notice this. Thomas showed back up. He didn't say, I'm going to chill at my place. If Jesus really wants me, he'll come get me. No, he showed up. He kept pressing in. He was there eight days later. Even when he wasn't sure, he showed back up. It says the doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing there. Peace be with you, he said. Then he looks at Thomas and says, hey, put your fingers here. Look, look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. He meets Thomas in his doubt. He didn't say, hey, Thomas, what do you need to believe on me? He says, hey, come here. Son, I already just feel it. See, it's, it's me. I'm here. I know your doubts. I can handle them. And then Thomas shouts out, my Lord and my God. He exclaims this phrase of praise, like affirming, like, yes, it's him. My Lord and my God is right here in my midst. So what did Jesus do with Thomas? He responded to a doubter. He responded to a doubter. I am so grateful for this, that Jesus responds even when I'm doubting, even when I have questions. Jesus came to Thomas and gave him exactly what he needed. In one moment, he was doubting, and the next moment, he was shouting and declaring God's praise, just like some of you in this room will do when Jesus meets you where you're at, just like some of you will do when you encounter the living God who gave everything so that you could have new life in him, that you could have a purpose, that you could have joy and hope in a future, just like you will be as well. Just like when Jesus comes into your life and proves that God is not just distant in your doubts, but that he's in your midst in those times, that he meets you in them. I believe someone in the room needs to hear this today, or maybe some people in the room need to hear this. Jesus is not a standoff savior. He doesn't stand back from a distance, assessing your every move, giving you some sort of scorecard like, well, I'll give that a five out of 10. Like, no. If that was the case, he never would have went to the cross for us because we didn't earn that, we didn't deserve that, but he did it anyway so that we could have life and life to the fullest. If he feels far away, reach out to him. Walk towards him because he's reaching out to you. You can ask questions. You can take your frustrations to him. You can wrestle it out with him. You can complain. You can tell him you don't understand. Thomas asked questions. Thomas needed answers, and Thomas got answers. And then what did he do after this? What became of Thomas? We learn that he served Jesus faithfully. In fact, history and tradition tell us this, that after preaching Jesus and preaching Jesus and preaching Jesus, 
that Thomas was actually murdered in India in the year 72 AD or so. I wasn't there, so I can't verify that, but about 72 AD, when he would not back away from his faith in Christ. And they drove a stake through his stomach because he would not surrender his lordship, the lordship of Jesus in his life. He would not turn away from his faith. You see, strong faith comes from having doubts and pressing into Jesus through them. Amen? Amen. Strong faith. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but that's some strong faith. Taking a stake in the gut because you won't turn away from who you know is your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> and this proves to us, and I hope you feel this, that when you have questions, when you have doubts, they don't disqualify your faith. If you continue to head towards Jesus, they strengthen it. I'm so grateful for that. Your faith is a journey. It's never a destination. It's never a destination until Jesus comes back. And so what's going to happen? At some point in your life or in the life of a friend, a classmate, a, a child, a brother, a sister, there's going to be a question. You're going to have a doubt. If you haven't had one recently, one's probably coming, and that's okay. You're going to have this moment of insecurity. You're, you're going to want some more details about something, and you're going to want an answer that you don't yet have. And your spiritual enemy, the devil, is going to try to use your doubt to drive you away from God. See, that's how he works. It's like, oh, there's a little doubt creeping in. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to try to get you to turn from Jesus so that you're walking towards lies instead of walking towards light and truth. That's what the enemy does. If you have doubt and lies in your head that are getting amplified to a way that is driving you away from God, I need you to pray for the devil to be silenced in the name of Jesus because that's not of God. He will co-opt those things. He will tell you, you're not a real believer. You don't have perfect faith. This stuff isn't real. Church, the church doesn't care about you. God's not involved in your life. He's not good. He doesn't love you. He's not with you. He, has he really forgiven you? I don't know about that. You've been too bad. You've been too filthy. After you said what you did, he doesn't want anything to do with you. You act like that and you think God wants something. These are the things, and I bet as I'm saying them, you've heard them. These are the things that the enemy tries to whisper and then shout in your ear to get you to walk this way. Just like in the garden when Adam and Eve hid because they realized they were naked and their shame caused them to hide from God. The enemy tells you lies to cause you to try to hide from the only one who can save you. He's going to try to use your doubt to drive you away from God. But Jesus uses our doubt to draw us to God. God is so good that Jesus came to Thomas in the middle of his doubts. He wasn't insecure. He wasn't like, oh, I don't know if I want to see, if I want to see Thomas. I, I hear he's kind of upset that I didn't come to him yet. Like, no. He's like, hey, Thomas, come on. Let's get this over with so we can move on. He doesn't shame him. He's like, oh, there's Thomas the doubter. No. He says, hey, come on. My son, c come check it out. Verify. Get your questions answered. I'm here. I rose from the dead. I did everything that I've been telling you guys for the last couple of weeks I was going to do, and you didn't quite get it. I'm here, okay? We're going to be okay. And he says, my God, my Savior. Like, he, he proclaimed, he declares this phrase of worship out of that encounter. And I don't know about you guys, but this idea of Jesus coming in the, to me in the middle of my doubts, like, I need this revelation often, I need this frequently because guess what? I have doubts sometimes. You're not the only one. Like almost every week I'm wrestling through scripture and there's hard situations in life and there's death and tragedy and broken circumstances in my life or the life of the, the people that I get the honor and privilege to walk with. And, and doubts start to creep in through that stuff. And then the enemy starts to amplify those doubts and tries to convince me that I am no longer qualified or that I have to figure out all of these questions before I can say or contribute anything of value. And then I'm reminded of when I first encountered Jesus. It, just, it never fails. I come to these moments, and there's the lies, and there's all this noise and, and static. And then God graciously reminds me of when I first encountered him. I remember when Jesus first jumped out of the pages of the Bible and I saw him move in my life and start to transform my heart and my relationships and my family. And I remember in those moments that Jesus loves broken people like me, 
like us. And I remember that it's by grace through faith that we are made right with God. By grace through faith. And then I realized, okay, faith. It takes faith. It's always going to take some faith. And if there's any proof at all, what Jesus has done in me, what he's done in your life is proof. Like, will you just consider what he's done in your life? How he's encountered you, how you've seen him move in and around your life. It proves that he's doing something. Just because you don't like how he did it or he didn't do it on your timeline doesn't mean he's not doing something. Amen? I believe everybody in here has some experience, some encounter that they can draw from as proof that God exists and he is working in their midst. You see, I was lost and then I was different. And what happened in between was faith. It was an encounter with Jesus. It was him doing something in my life. I have faith to believe. I don't have faith that I know all the answers or I'm going to know all the answers, but I have faith to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he offers to me what he says he offers, that my eternity is secure because of what Jesus did and we celebrate on this day. And I discovered in this that faith is not the absence of doubt, but faith is the means to push through doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt, it's the means to push through it. And worship team, you can come back up. I need you to hold on to that. Because the world and church culture might try to tell you that faith is actually ignoring or, or not believing the, or the absence of doubt. But faith is actually the means to push through doubt. Scripture says in Psalm 23... That even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. When you're in a valley, what do you do? What do you do when you're in a valley? You get through it. You keep walking. You get through the valley. You don't stay in the valley. You keep walking through it. Somebody in here today, you're not in the valley of the shadow of death. You're in the valley of the shadow of doubt. You find yourself in this perceived valley of doubt and you're like that mountain is so high how can I ever ascend all of the knowledge that it's going to be required to get up there and God's not saying hey let me give you all that knowledge you asked for he's saying just keep walking towards me we'll get there together we'll get there together when Jesus comes back guess what you'll probably be at the top of that mountain but for now will you have the faith to push through the doubt, to encounter him in a fresh way every day. Do not let your doubt be your dead end. Do not let your doubt be the point of deconstruction. Let your doubt be the point where you step closer to him, where you continue to pursue him so you can see him working in your life. Doubt is not a roadblock that's saying turn the other way. Doubt just might be a little pothole. You're like, gosh. Now i got to actually use my muscles and do something here. Walk towards Jesus and see what he's going to do in you. If you're in the valley of the shadow of doubt right now, just keep walking. Just keep showing back up. Just keep asking questions and trying to trust God. You don't have to have faultless faith. You just have to have a little bit of faith and keep going. And this morning, the invitation is simple. In the midst of your doubt, your questions, your hardships, and your circumstances, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Because there's nothing else outside of Jesus that will satisfy you, answer your questions, bring you a fullness of life, give you eternal security and significance. All of us in here have chased it. But there is nothing outside of Jesus that can meet all of these needs. If you're in the middle of the valley of the shadow of doubt, just keep walking toward Jesus. Come to Jesus because faith is a journey. It's not a destination. If you have your doubts, come to Jesus. If you're struggling right now, come to Jesus. If you've got questions, he can handle them. Bring them to Jesus. If you've got sexual baggage, take it to Jesus. If you've got secret addition, addictions and you've tried to overcome them but you can't, take them to Jesus. If life doesn't seem fair and you wonder why and you don't have answers for things, take your burdens, take your hurts, take them to Jesus. Cast, your, cast them upon him because he cares for you. If you've got church hurts, if people in the church have hurt you, take them to Jesus. Do me a favor, wherever you are right now in the room, just stand up. Stand with me. 
We can give these things to Jesus because we stand on the truth of what we celebrate today, that Jesus lived the perfect, sinless life. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose back to life three days later, conquering sin, Satan, and death. And in conquering death through him, the old has gone, the new has come. And when you bring these things to Jesus, he has the power to deal with them. He has the desire to deal with them. You're not inconveniencing him. It's a joy to him to deal with this stuff. That's what he does. That's why he gave his life for you. Jesus defeated death. He defeated the grave. And today we celebrate that. It's a cause for joy. It's a cause for hope. It's a cause for a shout of praise. Because hear me with this. Your life truly begins. You can experience true freedom when you put your faith in the one who defeated death. Can I get an amen? When we're free, come join the song. understand this truth that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. If you come in here today heavy laden and burdened and maybe you felt like you were just spiritually limping into this place, you were dragging something behind you, there is freedom in Jesus' name. There is freedom in this place. Will you put your faith in Jesus to be the hero of that story or will you keep trying to find other things, other people and other places for that? Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus for his grace, his love, for his mercy, and for the empty tomb. God, I thank you for that. And even as I'm praying this morning, I, I believe that there's some of us in here that it feels like significant parts of our life are just kind of in shambles or kind of a mess right now. You feel wrecked, you feel left out, you feel outlooked, you feel alone, you feel broken or ashamed, and you've tried to heal and overcome sin, but you keep finding yourself back in it. You feel guilty for what you've done, where you were, how you've acted, or maybe you even try, have tried by your own power to be good enough for God, but you simply can't be good enough for God. And do you know why? And this is the big question that this asks today. Do you know why? Because we are simply not designed to be good enough on our own. Jesus says to tell the gospel to the entire world, well, what is the gospel? The gospel is good news. But first, the bad news is pretty bad. And that's that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is that our God is amazing, that he became one of us in the person of his son, Jesus, born of a virgin, living without sin. Jesus was the lamb of God. He was perfect in every way, without sin, so that he could become sin on our behalf. The perfect sacrifice so that we could be forgiven. He died in our place on a cross and three days later by the power of God, the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty and Jesus was not there, defeating death, hell, and the grave. Therefore, listen to me, anyone, this includes you. It doesn't matter how dark your life is. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. Anyone who calls on the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, your sins will be forgiven and you will be made new. You may have questions, bring them to him. He can handle them. You may have doubts, still bring them to him. You may have insecurities, he says bring them. You may have brokenness, bring them. You may, your life may be a mess, he says come as you are. Call on his name and when you do, he will enter your life, forgive your sin and make you new. So today for those of you who say I need that, I need his grace, I need his mercy, just come to Jesus, just bring it to Jesus. The moment you call out to him, he forgives your sins, he makes you new. You know you need his forgiveness today. 
This is the day that God is calling you to step away from your old life and to step into your new life. This isn't just some religious decision. You're not just joining a church today. This is a spiritual decision. We're stepping away from the old, away from our sin, and we're stepping towards Jesus. By grace, you're saved through faith. You believe he's the son of God, he will forgive you. You're new, the old is gone, and the same spirit that raised Jesus for the dead, from the dead will dwell in you. So those of you who say, I need that, I want that, I want that truth for myself, I'm ready. I wanna walk away from my past, I wanna come to Jesus. Just lift your hands high right now, don't be ashamed. G bring it to Jesus, come to Jesus. If you're saying, I, I want you to take that, I wanna surrender my life to you, just raise your hands high, don't be ashamed. And just pray aloud with me. Pray, Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. I put my faith in Jesus and his work. Change me. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's put our hands together and let's celebrate what the Lord has done this morning. And let's finish with some praise.
test. Jesus can handle your... I'll try one more time. Jesus can handle your... Amen. I pray that that's good news for you today. I pray that you encountered Jesus in a fresh way today and that it will do something in your life moving on from here. That today is not the day of Easter bunnies and eggs. Today is the day of an empty tomb a resurrected Savior who gave his life for you and me. And while we may celebrate utilizing those other things, that's not the point of today. I pray that your heart is stirred. I pray that you're comforted, that you feel like God met you in this moment. And I pray that we see you again next week. Before you leave today, we have coffee, we have donut holes in the back. There's a photo backdrop set up right, out, set up right outside. It's nice out so you don't have to like have an umbrella to be outside in Oregon today. But please take a photo uh, with your family, with whoever you came with. Love it if you tag the church in it so we can see all your beautiful faces and the pictures just for kind of our memories for each year. Make sure you meet somebody before you leave. If you raise your hand and you're like, yeah, I'm giving it to you, Jesus, please talk to somebody at the connect table before you leave so we can just follow up and make sure that you have someone walking alongside of you as you pursue Jesus. Amen. I love you guys. I pray you have a great day and we'll see you next week. God bless.